Okay, so we're here with my good friend, Idan Ravine. He's an elite level performance coach. He's coached everyone from best NBA players of all time to uh, musicians, to all kinds of performers, all kinds of athletes and, so, and all kinds of uh, professionals. And today we want to have a conversation about commitment and discipline. So welcome, Idan. Oh, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. And uh, my first question for you is, you know, you've worked with all these people who are the best at what they do. And I want to know what kind of skills can we derive uh, from those kinds of people, from that level of performance and apply to the masses, to the general population? So I'm going to give you an anecdote from uh, arguably the greatest basketball player in history who passed away last year. So I got the good, I had the good fortune of being able to spend some time training Kobe Bryant. And I remember getting a, a call in the middle of the night and I picked up the phone. It was from a restricted number and I was like, I'm not going to answer this call. And I just put it down. And then a couple seconds later, it was a text message and it was, uh, Idan, it's Kobe, you know, give me a call. So I called him and he asked me, um, if I would meet him down in, uh, Dallas during NBA All-Star Weekend. Um, he wanted to train <clears throat> in the mornings while All-Star festivities were going on. And if you've never been to NBA All-Star Weekend, it's a pretty amazing place. It's like you see all the fans, all the corporate sponsors, all the entertainers, all the celebrities. It's, it's really, it's like a massive party for several days. And what was so interesting to me is that Kobe, as big as the personality as he is and as famous as he is, he also wanted to devote those mornings to training. And so I fly down there and um, we end up training at 5.30 in the morning. And look, 5.30 in the morning is not that big a deal, but it is a big deal when you're talking about it's in the middle of one of the biggest celebrations. And he didn't have to get up at 5.30 in the morning. He could have seen me at 11 or 12 or 1, but that's what he wanted to do. And I remember, um, you know, we would train, we do stuff. We, and when we were done, he just kind of sat on the, like, he sort of sat down with the ball in his hand. And he closed his eyes and he began sort of visualizing and kind of recalling what we had just done. And I thought like that we're playing, it in his we're head. playing in his head. And I thought, which was so, you know, like getting the chance to spend a little bit of time with him. My takeaway was it wasn't that the intensity was so unusual because I have had, I've been able to work with LeBron James some and Stephen Curry and Chris Paul and Kevin Durant and Carmelo Anthony, many of the athletes that have a, high level of intensity. The takeaway was the ability to um, maintain that intensity over a lifetime. And that's the part where to me that Kobe Bryant is just, was one in a trillion. Uh, I guess compared to the idea of, um, you know, when you have final exams in college or in grad school, to be able to maintain that work and devotion and focus for a week is, is draining. And then when school, once the finals are over, you're almost like, okay, I'm calm. I'm going to relax now. People then they get sick because they dedicate so yes. much. But he did it all day throughout his life. Like every day was like final exams. The devotion and the effort and everything that he would put into it was just so, was so extraordinary that you thought, man, how do you keep this up? And when people ask me, like one of the things I remember the most is just, it's the mental stamina that he had that to be able to be so committed and so devoted and so serious over a course of a lifetime, it was to me so in incredibly inspiring and courageous and just memorable. And I think that, um, uh, you know, when people ask me like, what does it take to be great? Part of what I think to be great is that it's consistency. It's consistency in effort, it's consistency in like uh, in focus. That's what like makes people remarkable. I mean, it's, e it's easy to start for a couple of days and then, you know, at running at 100 miles an hour. It's another thing to do it when it's 34 degrees outside and it's cold and rainy and you're tired and you want to sleep in. And that's what makes it so challenging. And that's why those people are so great. No matter what field you're in, it's the ability to kind of maintain that consistency and that focus throughout. And that, you know, that to me is one of the biggest takeaways if you want to be great is that you have to actually, you make that commitment to yourself, right? Um, you know, it's easy to do it when the lights are on, but when the lights are off, well, that's when it's hard. And how do you think uh, the average person, how do you think that they can find 
um, or commit themselves, even even if it's a week or a month, uh, I, just I, to make that change in, 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 in their mindset. I, I think it's about committing yourself to small things first. Um, I know I, you people hear this all the time, but start by making your bed, right? And then see if you can maintain that. Um, oftentimes, I think with elite athletes, you know, nutrition is very important, but when you're 23 years old, I, I don't put that much weight in nutrition as I would with someone who's later on in their career. Because when you're 23 years old, the truth of the matter is you can have a Twinkie and a fried ice cream and you're still going to be good, right? But, as, but for civilians and later on in your careers, nutrition becomes much, 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 much more and more important, right? But the, the thing that I found with nutrition is that it is an example of discipline and commitment. So if at 19, if you can be committed to food, then you're starting down the track of being able to be committed to other things as well. And so when people ask, like, how do you become great? I think first you have to just get used to the idea of what is great, what is commitment, and master it with small things. You know, do you put your clothes away? Do you make your bed? Do you fold your laundry right away? Do you go to bed at 10? Do you get up at 5? You master sort of that level of discipline and structure. Then from there, you can start thinking about the bigger goals that you have in life. And what kind of... Uh... What kind of struggles do you think people at the very top in sports, let's say, what kind of struggles do you think that they have in common with the average person? Well, I always say, um, because I've had the good fortune of working with the best of the best, it's one thing to get to the top, it's another thing to stay there. And, in that, in that, and because of that, I think they have everything in common with everybody else. Because them staying at the top is no different than Bob starting from the beginning. Right? It still requires the same intensity and focus. Maybe there's a lot less pressure, but it's still kind of the same journey in that respect. And so there's actually there's a lot in common with that. Yeah, so I think one big thing with our program is we try to establish habits early on that are easy to maintain consistently so that we can achieve the results that we want. Realistic results in a re realistic time frame, but more importantly, that, 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 that they last. Absolutely. So what do you think are some things that people maybe maybe it's a, a shift in their mindset maybe it's it's a habit or a skill but what do you think people need to do to keep this going to stay at the top oh it's a great question i it reminds me like several years ago i was asked to do make an appearance on a show for abc and uh, um it was a it was a daytime show that kind of helped people kind of reinvent themselves and I was asked to come on and do sort of a segment on what people can do, you know, in the office to kind of stay fit. And before, like it was a live audience for ABC. And before um, I went on, there was another woman who is really, really smart lady. And she was an editor of a, of a women's magazine. And her segment was talking about um, what people can snack on at work to stay healthy. And she sat down in sort of this make-believe desk and she opened up the drawer and she pulled out almonds in a plastic bag. And I thought, I get where you're coming from, but I disagree with you. I don't disagree with the fact that almonds are good, but the reason we're having this conversation is because you don't have control about how many almonds you can eat. So what it comes down to is that it's this element of people lack discipline. And if you had discipline and learn how to develop discipline, then you realize that six almonds is all I can have. But if you're eating only six almonds, you don't have a weight loss issue. You don't have a weight issue because you've already established that base level of discipline that everything else should come easy after that. And so I find that to be elite or whatever you have to do, there has to be discipline. There has to be structure and there has to be commitment. Those to me, are like, like the 10 commandments of finding greatness and becoming good at what you do. And then from there, you can apply to different sectors of what you want. So let's say you want to be an amazing physician or swimmer or basketball player or actor, well, you first have to have commitment, discipline, right? And then from there, we can kind of talk about, okay, how do we actually make that happen as an actor, as an athlete, as a, you know, as a physician? So that's when you, you know, give uh, the subject, you know, you give it a little more framework and then you decide, okay, specific, you know, with regards to this person, their lifestyle, their goals, how are we going to tackle this? Yes, and then you build programs related to that, right? But in the, but in the beginning, it's about kind of creating a, uh, a foundation like a it's like you have to pour the cement first you know before the, so the ground is the ground you can build on top of the ground so you were talking about the mental game and to me it seems like the first step would be to establish a sort of like mental framework 
Oh, absolutely. And to just be able to be comfortable with discipline, to be able to be comfortable with focus, be able to be comfortable with like consistency. And in some ways, like, I think, um, I mean, people ask me, what kind of tools are those? Well, I think learning meditation is up to me very effective right there because it does teach you discipline and does teach you focus and it does teach you to slow yourself down a little bit, right? So if you're able to kind of create that base level, then from there you can start building the house, right? You can start finding the windows and the doors and the architecture. So I think one thing that's interesting to know, and I'd love to get your take on this, is, you know, with athletes, um, these people, they, they start at a very early age, you know, working on, let's say, playing basketball. I saw right. when they're very, very young. Sure. And they spend their whole lives playing and they identify, you know, certain skill level or someone identifies them sure. and picks them out and they start to train them. And, mm -hmm. and I think the difference with people who want to lose weight, let's say, right? right. People who want to just not even lose weight, let's say get healthy. Right. And they've, they've spent 20, 30, 40, 50 years uh, right. living a certain way. It's, right. it's sort of like the... In, in some ways, it's like the opposite of a basketball player, but in the same way, it's it's the same in the sense that they're doing something uh, for years on end. They're creating these habits, these lifestyles. Right. And how do you change all well, of a sudden? Well, I also think it's about people. If you've done something for 30 years, well, you're not going to wake up the next day and change everything. It's like so you have to. It's a process and it takes time. and You have to be sort of gentle and compassionate with yourself as well. I think the idea that you know, you've been eating, you know, donuts, a couple of donuts before work every day for 25 years. And then the next morning, you be like, hey, no more donuts. That doesn't make sense. Yeah. I mean, I'd rather you continue to have the donuts. But in the meantime, let's start creating more discipline and structure throughout your day. Because once we're able to create discipline and commitment and structure, I can assure you that the donut snacking will start going away because there's more to the donut snacking than the donut. The donut represents other things as well. Donut represents, I don't feel so good about myself. The donut represents kind of like, well, the hell with it. I'm already 100 pounds overweight. Who cares if I have another donut? Right? The donut is not just a donut. It represents kind of like a self-esteem issue. Or it's a comfort issue. Or like a, um, I'm trying to find something to sort of uh, latch onto that makes me feel good. And I think there's all those psychological and sort of personality th issues that, that we can sort of find with the donut. And so to me, like diets don't start with changing food. Diets start with changing sort of how you see yourself and creating a little bit of certain structure and discipline in your day. And once you're able to do that, then you can start no different than my programs with people. Then you can start integrating. Let me put a diet plan in place because it'll be easier for you to sort of digest that versus just saying no more donuts. And what do you think about people who are in denial? Because a lot of people, maybe they have on paper, they have these these health issues or maybe their friends and family know that they're unhappy and unsatisfied. Right. But oftentimes, you know, it's a defense mechanism, you know, from a psychological sure. perspective. Sure. How, do you, how would you uh, approach someone who's in denial? I, I, again, with my athletes, I, I never force them to do anything. I never force them to run. I give them options. And usually I tell, ask them, I usually ask them which one they want to pick. And they generally pick the harder option. I think oftentimes that, uh, People are in denial because I don't think they want to be force-fed advice, right? But I think if we're kinder with them and more gentle with them and we give it to them in a softer way, I think it's easier to digest. And look, if your whole life you've been overweight, then it, it just sounds impossible that now all of a sudden I'm now going to lose 150 pounds, right? But I don't think the approach is to make you lose 150 pounds. I think the approach is let's build a different way of looking at these situations, right? Like. Why are you 150? Is it because you kind of feel lazy? Well, let's work on the lazy part. Because you want to feel unmotivated? Well, let's work on the motivating part. Is it because you lack structure? Well, let's work on the structure part. And then from there, we can start tackling the other issues about, uh, you know, about food, right? I don't, I think there's, um, it's like my athletes, sometimes, you know, I'll, I'll hear other trainers talk about, oh my God, I just kicked his ass or I killed him the first workout. I'm thinking, well, then you didn't do right the good job. Yeah. Because it's day one. Why are you killing them with anything, right? If there's, it's just, it's, uh, you know, it undulates, right? Some days it's hard and then you build into your program and you build a baseline and then you move up. I think it's the same way with diet and nutrition and health. It's like you have to build a proper baseline before you start introducing more complexity, more difficulty into people's patterns. You know, it's one of my biggest frustrations as a professional in this field and the health, wellness and, you know, the weight loss field is, People tend to be attracted to those programs that advertise the greatest amount of weight loss in the shortest period of time. Sure. And it's a shame because they sacrifice so much, in, you know, throughout that process. 
Right. Uh, what do you think? And going back to approaching people and, and their mindset. Right. Uh, what do you think is the best way to approach someone who's done, let's say, yo-yo diets, who's who's tried it all? Well, and, I think people are looking for a magic pill, and the reality is there is no magic pill, right? I, I think there. Yeah. If you're going to lose 100 pounds in three weeks, you're going to gain it back in one week, right? So to, to me, it's about uh, hoping that you can show people that life is more enjoyable when you're a little bit healthier, that life can be more enjoyable when you pick a better food option, that you will sleep better, that you will feel happier. It's just creating different associations that people have. So oftentimes the gym can be a, a crappy place to go if you don't feel good about yourself. So why would you go there? It's a place filled with skinny people. You'll avoid it. Right. So to me, it's just about showing people that there's other options, that there's other alternatives, that you can make things gentle, you can make things kind, you can make things like, uh, you know, like, um, I guess, pleasant versus feeling that I'm being force fed broccoli because no one wants to be force fed broccoli. Right. And um, what's your I like that you said showing people because yeah. I'm very big on showing versus telling. Yeah. And I'm wondering now, perhaps this is a little bit off topic, but just let's say for a trainer, right? Someone who has the intention of helping another person get healthier and lose weight. Right. Um, I've heard um, that sometimes trainers intimidate people, you know, instead sure. of setting an example. So can you talk a little more about showing versus telling? Um, I. Okay, for example, if. If I'm a homeless man and I go to the buffet line, right, and I'm waiting to eat and I see the person in front of me kind of like uh, fill their plate with food and now there's no food for me, how, is the home how does the homeless man, the hungry man feel? It feels like crap, right? So when you go to the gym, and I don't know if this is it's necessarily inspirational, but sometimes it can feel too aspirational. So you go to the gym and the trainer you meet with has big bulging biceps or this and cut the shirt on their phone and Instagram photos. And it feels like someone who they kind of feels kind of crappy about themselves. I don't think they look at the trainer in an inspirational way. I think they look at the trainer and going, you're kind of rubbing it in my face right now. Right. So I think sort of the more understated and the more humble and the more compassionate, like the trainer is to the person that they're working with, they can kind of slowly like develop that trust. And um, then that client feels sort of more comfortable. Like I don't, I don't know. Like if, if I was feel super enthused to go, if I was an overweight guy, I'd go to the gym, and the person I'm working with, you know, has three percent body fat. In some ways, I'd feel like, shit, this is a waste of my time because I'll never have three percent body fat, right? And I think sometimes what happens in that space is that uh, it becomes more about the trainer and the practitioner versus more about the patient, the customer, or the client. Great, thank you. And what do you think about people who are obsessed with with metrics, with numbers? You know, I think data has its place and is extremely important. Yeah. And, and all kinds of metrics are, are you know, it's, it's great to monitor. But in my opinion, there's some people that are just too close with the number and they miss out on the steps that it sure, takes to sure. get there. So what, what do you have to say about that? I mean, it's like, you know, you're so concerned with getting an A on the exam and it's like you're kind of forgetting that you have to study and you have to memorize and you have to learn like analysis and synthesis and it's like um if you're really going to be successful in losing weight or any of your goals like i think there has to be a part of developing really good habits and enjoying part of the process and i do think that um there is something can be joyful about struggle because it it shows you that it matters to you right like um you know, I've been in the gym with some really, really famous people that have cried right in front of me. I've seen some big tears from people you would never expect. And sometimes they're very embarrassed. And I say, I go, bro, I'm, or sis, if sometimes it's been women athletes, I go, thank you for sharing. Because if it didn't bring you to tears, I'd, I'd realize it didn't matter to you that much. And there can be joy in that struggle. And I think oftentimes that people are, um, they see struggle as such a negative thing. And I'm thinking, no, it's like, it's, you just it's it's you're building a better habit you're struggling because you're getting stronger you're struggling because you're reinventing yourself like those are all those become persistent if you're not struggling to me it's just a very temporary change that's going to come back to your you know to homeostasis very soon yeah well, as they say in physiology the the nature of the stimulus is responsible for the, the nature of the adaptation yes and you can struggle but it's if 
my opinion, it's the intentions behind that struggle. It's how you're struggling that sure. dictates the kind of sure. response you're going to see in your body, whether it's healthy or not. Sure. And like you only you only improve through change and adaptation and some struggle. Otherwise, we're going to be the same. And I don't I'm not I don't want to be the same. Well, Idan, thank you so, so much oh, for your my time. my pleasure. Thank is, you for having me. Is there anything else that you'd like to add? Um, just for people, you know, who struggle with weight or struggle with work or just to be a little bit more compassionate with yourself and not beat yourself up if, like, you feel like you, you're not where you are. Think more, step back and say, you know what, create a plan for myself and let me just kind of take small bites and just be consistent because those small bites and consistently will lead to bigger bites and bigger change. And oftentimes I find people so hard on themselves and they punish themselves and they exercise harder and they're, they're punitive in their food and tell themselves, okay, I can't have the piece of bread because I didn't do this. And I think psychologically that's terrible, right? I think there's just a kind of a, there's sort of a lack of reward. Um, and I'd rather just people sort of take their time and realize this is a long process and you're not going to lose weight overnight. You're not going to become president overnight. You're not going to be an NBA player overnight. Right? The, the people who win are the people who are able to maintain that consistency and discipline and focus over a lifetime. When That's the lights the are on and when the lights are off. Exactly. Yes. Thank you so much, Idan. Oh, it was really a pleasure me. having you. I really appreciate it. it. Thank, Thank you. you.